If you have Instagram, or you have a TV, or you have a magazine, you have been undoubtedly brainwashed deeply. Your values are fucked. Some of my closest friends are being torn to fucking pieces by their pursuit of being a successful driver. Or you're trying to keep every area of their life happy to me. They're just, they don't have anything else. This constant pursuit of something, you are already enough. Being a broke kid with bankrupt parents, that was the only black kid in an all white school. I was like, someone's just offered me 25 million. And like, what am I gonna go do with it? I'm gonna go buy this massive fucking house and this car. And then what? How long have you been with it? Like seven months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Welcome to the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast and video series for YouTube. So I've just finished interviewing Steve Bartlett. Now Steve runs social chain and media chain. They're a huge company. I think they do 180 odd million pounds in revenues, or at least that's projected. He's one of the biggest social media influencers in the country. He's 27 years old. He was hustling away in business at school, as he'll tell you. We covered a lot in this podcast. We also talked about social media trends and where he believes social media is going. We covered a heck of a lot in a fairly short amount of time for me and my podcast. So come with me to the interview with head of social chain, the young CEO of the year, Steve Butler. Steve, I want to say a huge thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rob. So you've flown literally from the other side of the world? Yes, landed two hours ago. Yeah, yeah. you got here on time. I did. I came from Peterborough. <laughs> that was half an hour late. <laughs> That's how it happens sometimes. Yeah, yeah. someone um, jumped before the train, so. Yeah. But yeah, it's, you have to remember to be grateful, don't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And according to virginstartup.com, um, you built Europe's largest, fastest growing social media agency. Mm -hmm. um, it also says you dropped out of uni. Mm -hmm. So what I think would be really cool to do, mm -hmm. totally how you want to play it, sure. take us on that journey from sure. dropping out of uni to the big empire you've got now. Sure. So, um, Expelled from school when I was 16 for for spending too much time running businesses. So I was I, my attendance had hit 30 odd percent, 33 percent according to Mr. Thompson. And I hope the, he's watching. <laughs> the, uh, no, he's not. He's I think he's left that school now. But 70 oh. percent of my time was spent doing deals for the, either for the school or organizing the school's uh, like school trips. So by the age of 16 and 17. All of the school trips that my peers went on, and I was in Plymouth, which is about four hours away from here. We went to Thorpe Park, to Manchester. I organized every detail of all the school trips at 16. And then by 17, I'd done all the deals for the vending machines in our school. So our school were planning on buying vending machines. I negotiated a deal where we got, we got them for free and 20% of the revenue and profits. Um, and I was so consumed with that stuff that my, and so um, disinterested with education that by the age of 17 my attendance was so atrocious that the um mr thomas um it gave me the expulsion letter and the first expulsion letter they gave me was rejected by mr sprinkle who's that who was the head of key stage five he said you're my harry potter quote you make the school a lot of money so we keep you here um but by the end it got so bad that even he um agreed to my expulsion in the last month of school went up to manchester after getting into a very poor university went for one lecture decided that it wasn't for me because it was like school again. Um, what people, was it? What were you reading? I was doing reading. business management. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but on that day, there was a girl next to me asleep on the desk and it, I got the impression almost instantaneously that um, this wasn't the place where I was gonna learn to be the entrepreneur that I wanted to be. This was in fact a place where people went when they um, didn't know what else to do with their lives. Yeah. And that was so apparent so early. Dropped out after one lecture. Um, Called my mum, told my mum I was dropping out. She told me never to speak to her again. So we didn't speak for three years because she, uh, she's African and you know the Nigerian uh, philosophy towards education is very strict. Um, had the business idea to start my first business called Wall Park and then went on that journey for three years to build that business and learn how you raise investment and how you build a team and how you make a website and how you market it. And three years into that business, after I'd raised investment from some of the biggest social network um, on investors in Europe, I um, had to market the platform when we finally launched. And when it came to marketing the platform, I learned about social media. And I started in 2000, and, I don't even know the bloody year, six years ago, seven years ago. Um, it was a student website. So I started looking for student communities online, found a couple student communities, Twitter pages, Facebook pages, met the owners, told them to drop out of university to come and join me. We drove a million people to my website every single month. I thought that was more interesting than my website, the social media component. So 21 years old, I quit that company and I spent the whole year going around the world, meeting every person I could that had built a big social media page. But all of those social media pages got to about 130 million followers on social media. Um, 
hired all of those young kids, started two companies. One of them is called Media Chain, which is the, the seventh biggest media publisher in the world. Uh, we do 2.6 billion video views a month wow. on Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And the other one is the agency business you, you mentioned. Yeah, since social then, chain. Social chain, yeah. Um, since then, the, the, it's kind of evolved further. And this year, we'll do about 90 million selling e-commerce products that we own. So we use our media reach and our marketing services to sell products that we own. So about 100 million of our revenue this year will come from the, the marketing business the marketing and media business, and then about 90 million will come from us selling products that we own to our audiences. And was that part of this recent merger, is that? Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. So now Social Chain is a public company. Yeah. And um, this year we'll do about 100 and 170, 80 million revenue. Yeah. And um, that's across the UK, the US, and Germany predominantly. Um, and that's, yeah, that's where Social Chain is today. And the whole thing now is called Social Chain. There's no separation. So there's no right. media chain. There's no separate divisions. The whole company is Social Chain. Mm. Uh, yeah. What a journey. Yeah, a crazy journey. And crazy journey. It's been five crazy years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, there's a few things I'd like to ask in that For journey, sure. if it's all For right. Sure. Now that we've painted the timeline, which yeah, is yeah. great. Yeah. Um, why did you decide to go public? Um, a number of things. So we, we, we acquired a company that was already listed publicly. And um, a lot of the big, the world's biggest companies, in fact, go public via what we call a reverse IPO, where you find a, an existing public business and you buy it and merge into it. And that we, we looked at the options we had and felt that that was the easiest and most um, effective way for us to take our company public. The company is currently public in Dusseldorf, which is a small market with low liquidity. The company will move in... Um, um, next year, um, where we're planning a, a re-IPO, which will take it to the L London Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ mm -hmm. or the Frankfurt Prime Standard. But this is all obviously um, TBD. Yeah. And why do, you want, why do you want to do that? Why did you want to go public? Um, it's, a really, it's a really good way at our level to keep control of the company while raising significant capital to achieve growth. So um, when, you're, when you're thinking about how to raise capital, when you're at the stage we're at, you've got a number of options. You can, can get private investment, VC investment. A lot of these come with a lot of um, restrictions and covenants and um, issues. Um, going public presents us with um, a different set of issues, admittedly. They are. But um, a set of issues that is more conducive with us controlling the direction of the company and, the, and being able to achieve ambitious growth. Mm. Um, so you don't feel like you're going to be controlled, do you? You're controlled by the public and the, the, the public markets. And that control stems from the performance of the business as opposed to someone's opinion. Right, yeah. So if we perform and hit our numbers, yeah. then um, our stock is worth considerably more, which gives us more fuel to grow the business and achieve our global ambitions. And we're confident that we'll achieve our numbers. Yeah. So if we back ourselves which we do, then we're, then we're now willing to play to public scrutiny, I guess. Yeah. And we were just talking earlier about your podcast. Yeah, yeah. And saying sometimes it's hard for consistency and now you have oh, a sponsor, yeah. you, you kind of got more reason to be consistent. Mm -hmm. If you've got the public yeah. holding you accountable, yeah. accountability is great, isn't it? Even if it feels, feels painful it's in the great. moment. You know, organisations, when they go public, have to change a lot because the, the, the financial reporting changes drastically. So we're, we had to go undergo a change. And we've been planning this for the last 18 months, two years. Um, about how we operate and how we do our financial performance and tracking and professionalizing everything and bringing in senior leadership teams across the business. Yeah. So it's, it's been a very useful exercise for the company as well. And I think it's made us a much better company because of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. And how do you balance growing a big public company mm -hmm. um, or a big comma public company, mm -hmm. maybe not a big public company mm -hmm. yet, with your own social media brand? Because obviously you're You've got your own social media brand, which is, you know, out there, got a lot of followers, mm -hmm. put a lot of content out there. How do you balance that? Um, I have a great team of people around me. Um, I don't balance it particularly well. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that because my, my life is this battle of constant prioritization and often last minute prioritization where I can be scheduled to meet a very important person somewhere in the world and then something will come up. And also, you know, go on a holiday with my girlfriend the next day and something will come up, which means that I have to cancel all of the above and go in the opposite direction. And that also could mean that for the next week I can't produce content. So I can't be in front of a camera. I just have no choice. Yeah. Because if the decision that's in front of me is worth 20 million or, you know, like something like that, then 
Do you uh, say that to your girlfriend like that? You know, I, when you're blowing I, her out, it's I, like... No, I, it's I, genuinely, <laughs> genuinely, I try and give her as much... Because the thing I've come to learn with <laughs> personal relationships is you just have to sometimes hope that they, do, they understand that they don't understand. And what I, what I try and do with my girlfriend now is just try and give her as much context as I feel she wants before I, I see her, like, switching off. So I'll go... I'll try and explain to her why... Like, she was just with me in New York. And halfway through our, our one, like, holiday... I turn around to her and say, by the way, we're only together for seven days. I have to go to San Diego now for three days on my own. So she lands in New York from France. From France. We're there for two days, having a great time. Then one night I'm like, tomorrow morning I have to go for three days. And I'm, I've seen my, in my emails, I realize that I have, I try and see if this is really something that I have to go to. Yeah. And um, I realize that I have to get, and I just look over it on the sofa. And I'm like, how do I tell her that? She's flown here from France and I have to go for three days. Yeah. Unfortunately, she's just a fucking saint. Yeah. Like, maybe I'm in the honeymoon phase and she's going to tell me so funny. But she's just a saint about it. Yeah. She, like, she says, you've got to go do what you've got to do. Um, she says she kind of likes it, keeps the relationship kind of fresh. Yeah. And she's like super. And then, when, you know, like when I get back, I'm expecting that like fucking cold shoulder. She's just fucking so happy. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be a catch yet. How long have you been with her? Like seven months. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll figure it out, but... We'll do another podcast in five yeah, years. To yeah, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is why we got divorced. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, but it's, it's super cool at the moment. Um, but yeah, I don't prioritise well and I don't balance well. No. Those, so that's how, the how do you manage it all? If you don't prioritise well and balance it well, how do you manage it all? Is it just you leave to your team? Do you know, I do prioritise well. I don't, I don't have balance in my life. Yeah, I think balance is a bit of a myth though, isn't it? I think we're all like... You focus on your health and fitness. Mm. You know, maybe you're not so much time at home. Maybe you're at home a lot. You're not focusing on your empire. You're building your empire. You, you haven't got hobbies. Yeah. You've got a lot of hobbies. Your skin. Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes you go all in on stuff, don't you? And yeah. Just hope. Especially when there's nothing else there to fill the void. Yeah. And as entrepreneurs, if there isn't a girlfriend or there isn't, you know, kids or there isn't something else that's making you... Um, create time yeah. then you'll just fill it with work and yeah. I've, I've seen this in some of my really dearest friends that don't have that thing they, they're 35 they don't have a kid they don't have a girlfriend and I'll be honest with you the balance is tearing them to pieces some of my closest friends are being torn to fucking pieces by their pursuit of being a successful entrepreneur right, what, you're trying to keep every area of their life happy you mean they're just they don't have anything else right so they, they, they don't have the girlfriend or the kid and they're just spending every seven days a week in that office and they're just killing themselves and it's like yeah. they feel like they're on a treadmill and, and that's why um, balance is a bit of a myth for entrepreneurs because the business always feels like the priority like going to Nando's with my girlfriend it, like it's never going to be more important than a million pound deal with a brand or you know it's never so you have to like be forced to create or, or you have to have that discipline to schedule time with um, things that don't feel like their priorities. Yeah, do you know what? I think you've got some courage to say that. Um, I've, had, I've done a couple of posts here where I've said sometimes a business owner, mm-hmm. an entrepreneur, actually their highest priority is their mission mm-hmm. and th- that's what they're meant to do. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so quite a lot of partners, not just women now, obviously, you know, it can work the other way around, but they're like, no, wait a minute, I should be the most important. I mean, I I had kids eight and five years ago, and I know this for a fact, I am not as important to my wife as my children are. I know that. Mm -hmm. She spends more time with them. Mm -hmm. She will will humiliate me in in favour of supporting them. Mm. And I I think I'm okay with that now. It wasn't for a year or two because it was weird, but I think I'm okay with that now. And I think my wife's okay with, I'm out there on the mission Mm. because that's my job. Mm. Because if we're both on the mission, who's looking after the kids? If we're both looking after the kids, who's on the mission? Yeah. And I think a good relationship and a good team is, okay, he's prior to the mission or hers. Mm. I'll support and I'll look after the home. Mm. And what's wrong with that? And so the word priority creates this ego conflict. Yes, it does. Right? So you don't need to use it. No. There can just be harmony. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we think about things, even like work-life balance, it, it becomes these two things in conflict. Yeah, which, you separate them. Yeah. Why do you have to separate you, They don't need to be... And I think the same with, my, with the relationship dynamics. It's like my girlfriend's starting her business as well. I don't feel threatened by the... She doesn't need to call me or I don't need to know who the priority is. Mm. We're, we're in this together and there's we're trying to create harmony, yes. right? And um, I think that's a much better way. I've, I've been with my ex-girlfriend. If I'd used the word priority... It would have just, you know, it's an unnecessary conflict. Yeah. I think the certain maturity um, and se- sort of self-security and self-esteem, you don't feel so threatened yeah. by someone's ambition. Mm. I, when I was younger, I thought 
I don't need fucking anyone else. I don't need a girlfriend, <laughs> family. I don't need anything. When I was like 18 to, I'd say, 22 or 23. And then the first time someone came to me and said they wanted to buy my business, and I went home that day and Googled uh, on Right Move and Auto Trader the car and house that I could buy with that amount of money when I was 24. I felt so terribly empty at the thought of sitting in that, that Lamborghini and pulling up to this mansion. Uh, by, and I thought, where, where does this go? This really like horrible anticlimactic moment in my life where I was like, someone's just offered me 25 million. And like, what am I gonna go do with it? I'm gonna go buy this massive fucking house and this car. And then what? And I, I was living in a seven bedroom house with a tennis court, which I f was a fucking, it was a dreadful idea when I was 20, 23, 24. And I was like, well, this is so inconvenient, so impractical. And that's the moment that I started to realize that really my whole programming, which came from social media and being a broke kid with bankrupt parents, that was the only black kid in an all white school and feeling the sense of like constantly trying to feel, I, I guess, build self-worth and like, you know, chasing pleasure, thinking it was happiness, finally dawned on me that if I carried on with this pursuit of just like material stuff and like Lamborghinis and cars, I have a Lamborghini Aventador, by the way. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. No, Maybe I should No, but it's not, it's, it's why I'll you buy, buy the Lamborghini. It. It's, and that's the thing, it's why yeah. you buy it. So my 20, 18 year old Steve wanted to buy a Lamborghini because it would make me yeah. even happier. Yeah. Like it would scale my happiness, right? Yeah. I buy nice things now, mm. but I don't buy them under the pretense that they're gonna make me feel better about myself, yeah. right? I feel better, yes, but not about yourself. Not about That's myself, yeah. yeah. Not, not give me self-worth, because yeah. the anticlimax of when it doesn't, it doesn't make you, doesn't resolve your, your bullshit or your, your unhealed trauma, yeah. is I think even more dangerous than the unhealed trauma. The anticlimax, I really believe, messes people yeah. up. And how long you, pursue that climax to then have the anti-climax. Like the longer you pursue the fantasy. Mm. So I've got good friends who sold their companies for 75 million, 100 million, 200 million. And three of them said to me, it was the worth of their life. 100%. I mean, 100%. And, they were, and they would have dreamed of that for 15 years. 100%. And seeing their company ripped to bits by, you know, and then being sold for 5% of its worth five years later or something like that. Because what, what I think they'd mistaken, and this is probably what I'd mistaken, is they thought they were building, um, what, what they'd created was a ton of money, but what they'd created in themselves was like a ton of purpose every day. Yes. It was like the reason to get out of bed and enjoy what you do that day. And to exchange that for money, this is what I felt when I was 24. I was like, this, I, this I'm a person I won't name, this company wants to buy my company, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna exchange my purpose for 25 million. And I'm mm. looking at this 25 million and thinking, like, the, like, what am I gonna do with it to, to recreate that thing that I've already got? Mm. Like, and I, I don't think I can buy that thing like I've already got. I don't know how I buy it. So it felt like a really bad deal. And I was like, what number would feel like a good deal? I don't think there's a, so the, the reprogramming I went, underwent at 25 years old was, um, okay, I am in pursuit of growth and ambition and I do wanna grow a big you know, company, but why? And I, I spent the whole year just getting really down to the, the reason why. Yeah. And that means that when we go public and all these things, I'm happy because the reason it means something to me isn't an ex extrinsically motivated empty one. Yeah. I'm not, when, I, when I, we sign a big client now or, or we go public or whatever, or when I buy some, a nice like Louis Vuitton bag and like this fucking, I buy lots of this fucking six of them downstairs. <laughs> like, I'm not buying it because of extrinsic reasons, because of other people. I'm buying it in and of itself because I enjoy it. Yes. Irrespective of anyone fucking knowing that I'm doing it or having it. Yeah. And that has changed my life. Um, that's completely changed my life. Just understanding why it's that I genuinely think it's the single most important thing is to get to the root cause of why you, you're doing what you, what you do every day and why you want the things you want. Yeah. My friends are so fucking miserable because what well, this one friend in particular, multi-billionaire, right? Um, comes from a very wealthy background and he has so many sports cars outside his mansion Guy's fucking horribly miserable. Mm. Upstairs in his house, he's six, seven million pounds worth of designer clothes. One of the most miserable people, people I know. And he just keep on going because he doesn't know why he's, um, doesn't know why he's buying the, the fucking Louis Vuitton. He doesn't yeah. know why he's buying it. He, he, he thinks he's buying it to, to recreate some false validation that his parents didn't give him growing up. So he thinks that if I buy one more Louis Vuitton bag, I'll get validation, except, but you know, 
But that's like a, that's an empty hole. It's just a bucket, never... bucket with a hole in it, isn't it? It's a treadmill as well. Yeah, keep pouring water in. Hamster wheel, and then it's like a drug addiction because you need a bigger thing to reach yeah. that same feeling. Mm. And it's just never ending misery as far as, they call it the hedonistic treadmill, the yeah. stoic people in the, um, mm. And it's just, it's, it's a path to misery. And um, I had to reprogram myself because we've all been brainwashed. If you, if you have Instagram or you have a TV or you have a magazine, you have been undoubtedly brainwashed deeply. Your values are fucked. So you have to un unprogram yourself. Mm. Unfuck yourself. Mm. Yeah. Unfuck yourself. You have to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. I know quite a few billionaires. <laughs> and actually, I don't know if I've just been living in a different world to you, but at least five of the billionaires I know, the most grounded, down to earth, happy, pretty humble people. I know people. some good ones. Michael Birch is a great example. Yeah. The guy sold Bieber. He's my, one of my first investors. Um, no, he, I went and worked for him in San Francisco, San Francisco from the Friends of United founders were my first investors. And he, he made 800 million by selling Bebo to um, AOL back mm. in the day. And the guy was like, I've got a huge problem now. I've just got too much money. He went and bought a pub. Like yeah. the, this, that you would. Ne he wears the same clothes. You'd have no idea the guy was moved because he's not motivated by extrinsic factors like that. Yeah. He bought a pub because he fucking loves pubs, mm. and him and his wife wanted a pub in Cornwall. Yeah. He's got a billion. He invested in Pinterest as well, so he's got. He's a billionaire. Mm. Like that's the. You know, he's got a healthy relationship with that financial mm. um, asset that yeah. he has. And right. I think it's possible 100%. to make a lot of money and have good self worth 100%. and use money to fulfil. A drive, a motivation, a why, mm. as you said. I think it's possible. I think a lot, too many people separate it. Oh, I've met loads of rich people, they're all unhappy. I've met loads of poor people that are unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, we separate these things as human exactly. beings, don't being, we? Being, being broke is very painful. Yeah. It's just a different set of problems you yeah. have when you get rich, right? Yes. You, you've got, and you, and um, um, yeah, and I think the reason why some wealthy people and even lottery winners, we see the suicide rates amongst lottery winners, they, they end up being miserable is because the reason, that, because of their relationship with money, but the reason why they wanted money, maybe the reason why they were pursuing it, maybe the way they'd glamorized it in their own mind on the path there mm. was heavily extrinsically motivated. Yes. And they, in some respect, thought that some magical confetti was going to rain down on them when they made that billion or, you know, so it was going to be this internal feeling of euphoria. And I, and I just think the, the, the lack of it, the, the anticlimax is sets you off on this spiral of maybe it's prostitutes, maybe it's cocaine, maybe it's lamb, maybe it's, you know, far flying business class, maybe, and they're chasing something that doesn't exist. They're chasing yeah. after pleasure like a mirage in a fucking desert, like a watering hole in a desert, getting closer and closer and it's moving off into the distance and they just keep fucking running faster. Whereas Michael Birch, the guy was so grounded and so happy within himself, he made a billion and was like, oh, I've got my wife Sochi, I love her, mm. my life's good. Mm. Yeah. Don't need to chase anything, I am already enough. I think that's probably the, the most powerful three words <laughs> that I, and most profound and most simple three words that someone- I am enough. Said, 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 someone said to me one day, they said, um, they said, what if you're, you are already enough? And it's so simple, right? But it just shatters everything. It shatters every pr programming I had as a kid. You've got to climb the ladder. You've got to you know, pursue that, chase that dream. Do this constant pursuit of something, right? The, the words that maybe, what if, just imagine for a second, you are already enough. You don't need more followers. You don't need more stuff. You don't need to achieve more. What if you have everything you need and you're already enough? It al it's almost frightening. Yeah. For me, it's intimidating because it throws into question everything I believe about the world, mm. right? And it, then I think, okay, what's my fucking power? It's the same as when they offered me the money when I was 24 for my company. I thought, okay, so what's the fucking point in this then if it wasn't the thing I thought? But maybe that's the, maybe that's the key to happiness is that, that you know, that, the anti-programming that, in fact, you already have everything you need. Yeah. The world has just told you that you're lacking of something. Yeah. How can, how can, how can uh, influencers can, can convince you that they're followable if they don't first convince you that they have something you don't have, prettiness, fashion sense? How can marketeers sell to you from the age of one if they don't convince you that there's something you need that you don't have? Mm. And that's the, that's the general, that's, that's the programming when you look at everything is we're trying to convince you that there's, you now how can like gurus convince you that to follow them if they, they don't first convince you that there's wisdom that you don't have that you need to, and that's what life is. It's this like constant stripping of like, you, there's something you don't have. And I think that makes us unhappy. I think I was always happy. I think from when I was 18, I was I fucking had everything I needed, but the world had convinced me that I needed to chase something. So mm. 
my diary at 18 years old read four things, and everybody in this room has seen the photo of my diary. By 25, I want to be a millionaire. I want a Range Rover Sport to be my first car. I want to work on my body image, and I want to have a, yeah, a, a, and all of those, what are those fucking things? I want a Range Rover to be my first car. Why? I've never fucking driven a car in my life. I didn't have a driving license, but it was a status object that would, you know, and it would make me, in comparison to other people, have some kind of artificial worth. The next thing on my list, I want to be a millionaire. Why do I want a million? Why? Again, status. Just fucking the world had convinced an 18 year old kid that he needed a million. Why did I want to work on my body image? How can someone be like fat if, there isn't, if that isn't a subjective measure of everyone else? Again, that's just some comparison bullshit I was told. What if I was already enough? And in fact, a very happy person had convinced himself that he was missing something because the world had got into my head. And um, I don't want to chase forever. You know, I don't want to just keep fucking chasing forever. Um, life is a, an infinite game. And I think the, the perfect balance for me is to be ambitious and to go after worthy causes while realizing that I don't need to achieve them. Yeah, so I think you've just opened up a Pandora's box of the paradox of life. Because I'm sitting here listening to this, not in my head a lot in agreement. I am already enough. There is nothing wrong with me. I am perfectly imperfect. Everything as it sh is as it should be. Um, I have strengths that other people don't have. Yet you're still chasing and you're still taking your public company public and you're still traveling around the world, jumping from meeting to meeting to meeting, speaking to BBC, speaking to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, so... There's a paradox here, I think. And I, I'm a big believer that the world, the media and human beings, we go, it's left or it's right. Mm. It's black or it's white. It's labor or it's conservative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's up or it's down. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't think that that is life. I think there's this paradoxical, like almost inconceivable fuse and balance of all extremes. Mm -hmm. So I, I give you a little example of my theory and then you can riff on it sure. and see what you think. So um, I've studied happiness a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, because I actually do get quite a lot of happiness from material items, mm -hmm. but not because I need external validation, maybe a little bit, I'll be, I'll be honest, but mostly because of how I grew up. Yeah. And, 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 and the romantic notion of all the cars on the wall that I had when I was six working for my dad in his pub, mm -hmm. picking them off one by one as a, you know, like I am becoming who I'm meant to become. The single most... The thing to me that made me the happiest this year, that's not involving my children or my, or my wife, was Harry there. Mm -hmm. He was pissed at our Christmas party. He was pissed <laughs> as fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And he, he, said, he said to me, he said to me oh, there's, there's this scammer, there's that scammer, there's this company who's screwing people over. You're the good guys. I'll fight for you, Rob. I'm your foot soldier. I'm staying here for good. I will fight for you, Rob. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel a massive sense of pride and achievement yeah. and I did start going for the money because it's a measure isn't it it's, course, you know, it's if a company's not making profit it's not a company it's a hobby sure. um, but I had this little moment he won't know because he's too pissed um, and I, I just chucked tomato soup down a Alexander McQueen suit so it was all going wrong but I just, if I could have bottled that that's what yeah that was the best day yeah yeah that was awesome completely agree but then I've got a, manager, a management accounts meeting the next day and a board meeting the next day and we hit, set our targets for the next year. And so this happiness. So David J. Lieberman, I think it's worth studying. He's done a lot of science. Happiness is defined as progress towards yeah. a worthy goal. Yeah. So progress is I feel like I'm self-actualizing, I'm moving forward. Humanity's like purpose is to grow. Mm -hmm. Towards means towards something. Mm -hmm. Worthy. As in, it's valuable. And then goal is something that I haven't achieved yet. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting here saying, I am already enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't need to validate myself through external pursuits. Mm -hmm. Yet there's something in progress yeah. and achievement and self actualization i.e. being more than we already are, mm -hmm. that creates happiness. Yes. So loose, 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 loose. But I'm not disagreeing with you. No, no, I completely get yeah. it. I, I've read the... the that, from that author a lot, I know that yeah. quite well. Um, there's, an, there's a Chinese philosopher called Lu Cao, I think his name mm. is, and he says, the best journeys are ones where you never arrive. And you just said about your billionaire friends that's, that said the worst day of their life was when they got to that perceived milestone. Yeah. The whole point about creating an infinite lifestyle and an infinite company is you don't, you, your objective isn't to become the biggest. Yeah. It's one of the things I stripped from all of our company this year, did a big presentation in January to all of our teams. We're no longer playing to be the biggest, the largest, the whatever. These are all measures of comparison. Yeah. What happens when we become the biggest? What then? What's, 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 what
And why did we want to become the biggest? What yeah. was the inherent value in becoming the biggest? Mm. So the whole reframing was to make ourselves, our lives, my life, and uh, designed to be an infinite one. Not, not saying that I'm going to do the same thing every day, but it has to be designed in the way that it could be, which means it has to be fundamentally sustainable. We set three in values in our company, which are written on all the world walls now, which kind of play into this, which is um, our, the existential reason why our company exists, because you said you're going public. So the first one is the work, which is the combined value we bring to the world through the products. We second one is the welfare, which is the welfare of the people. And one of the things that, like you said about your colleague here, gives you the most fulfillment is when you see that people that have um, believed in you yeah. are happy, fulfilled, yeah. and um, are enjoying their life. Kieran moves to Peterborough from, or near Peterborough from where he lives because he's making a commitment to our cause. Exactly. Those things make me feel great. That in and of itself... Don't fucking move out, all right? Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't move back to Kettering. Same year that yeah. in and of itself, what you've described there, is a reason enough to run the business you mm. run, right? But you still need to make money to fund it. 100%. Yeah. That's why we got the work one there. Yeah. So the welfare one is the combined well wellness and, and happiness of the group, right? Yeah. So our, what we've tried to do at Social Chain is create a sustainable lifestyle for everybody. And we're trying to do this at the moment. We've got goals and measures and everything. A sustainable lifestyle for everybody within the team. That means that if he wants to fly to Germany and work there, he can. If he wants to take six months off and travel the world and come back to his job, he can. If he wants to take unlimited holidays, he can. If he wants, if he has a rough spot and he needs a mental health therapist, Social Chain will pay for all of that. And the whole point is trying to create a fully sustainable lifestyle for the people so that they don't have to, um, they can get the challenge and everything they want in an infinite way from this one organization. And the last one's the world, which is the combined impact that our business has on the world. We're going, we're going completely carbon neutral. We're donating a million dollars this year. To, we've donated 650,000 so far in our time and money to a variety of causes. There's 20 different goals around the world, one that the team have come up with collectively. And we don't want to be the company that cuts down the rainforest and then donates to the bees. Yeah. We have to learn to be sustainable within the, the, the forest, the ecosystem. Mm. And so the whole company is now being designed um, because of these like personal revelations that I had in my own life about like where, what am I playing for here, yeah. um, to be sustainable. So a yeah. place that I could live and work for the next 30, 40 years and get everything I want. Yeah. The, the challenge, the fulfillment, the chase, the, you know, but, but in a sustainable way. Yeah. And hopefully that kind of gives it context a little bit as to what, how I can still play this idea of building, of ambition with um, one where I am already enough, and this is a journey that's like I'm ambition without comparison. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And Simon Sinks just wrote a book, which I think came out maybe two months ago, called Finite and Infinite Games. And it's literally the same thing. We did the presentation in January, where we, I said we're stripping all of these things to try and create a sustainable business. Mm. And this concept of infinite games um, is now becoming super, super popular, and for good, good reason. Yeah. You know, like so many of my friends say, the minute they achieve their, their big goal in life, like even Gary said it a couple of times, the minute he buys the Jets, Gary Vinicek, he said, the minute he buys the Jets, he'll be the worst day of his life. He hopes he never does it. Well, the price will go up with him keep telling everyone he wants to Yeah, because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, I understand the, 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 but I don't know why you'd set that as a goal yeah. with, with that, with context in mind that the worst day of your life will be when you achieve it. Yeah. And why can't we be re unprogrammed to design companies that don't have those like, those, those like, you know, those, those unfulfilling mirage mountaintops that are actually, do you know, like when you, there's this thing in climbing where they call it like a false peak where you're climbing up a mountain and it looks like that's the peak and then you go onto it and you realize that it isn't. Right. And it's a really disheartening feeling for climbers because once they get to that thing they thought was the peak and they look up, they realize there's still another fucking five, uh, 50 miles to go. A climber said this to me last week when I was talking about this. And we set these false peaks in our life. We don't, I don't think we have to. I think we've been programmed to, to, to try and create them for whatever reason, but I don't think we have to. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to live out in my life. Yeah. 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 All right. So that's question one. Uh, right. fuck me. <laughs> fuck me, yeah. You said like you got expelled at what, 16, 17? 17. Obviously. So yeah. there's clearly something in you leading up to that age, which is disruptive or entrepreneurial. You know, you're breaking the system. Mm. You're becoming an entrepreneur at 16, 17. Yeah. Not everyone's done that. Some people are 40 or 50 and mm -hmm. looking to traverse into a, um, their own business. So what was it in your upbringing? What is it in you that made you entrepreneurial? I'll say two things. So the first thing is people say disruptive and whatever else. Do you know what I think it is? I just think it's like radically self-believing. Like I'm not, 
I think everybody has disruptive ideas, but I don't think people back themselves enough to take the risk and throw themselves into a moment of uncertainty to pursue it. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to ask, well, where did that come from? Where did that self-believingness or that self-belief come from? When I, when I, the only thing, and people can point in hindsight and create bullshit about where they came from. I'm going to do that now. Um, <laughs> my, when, by the age of about 10, my mum and dad were so consumed with my mum starting these businesses, which failed for 25 years. She can't read or write. And she came from Africa and is trying to start businesses in the UK with not, without a clue of what the, an iPhone or the internet is. She failed in her businesses for about 25 years and still doing it now. Um, by the age of 10, when I woke up in the morning, my mum wasn't there, my dad wasn't there. And when I went to bed at the age of 10, my mum and dad hadn't come home yet. So my mum was sleeping on the floor of her shop. And so of all my brothers and sisters, I'm the youngest, they all got parented. And I said I was the one that didn't get parented. I would like school dinners and stuff, I'd have to figure that out on my own. They, they weren't around. And again, that created this void as a, as a 12 year old that I was filling. I was doing a lot of things that I shouldn't have been doing. But one of them was I was learning to be independent. And um, I think having three older siblings, I think not having parents that were around every day, I think it created a very confident, um, uh, autonomous young kid. Yeah. And for some reason, which is, again, it's really hard to pinpoint, I just really fucking back myself. And at 15 years old, I'd come to the conclusion based on no solid evidence that I wasn't going to need grades. The only evidence I can, I was talking to the BBC earlier on this morning. So the only evidence I had was that I was able to, just going to keep it facts because there's only way I know how to do things, is I was able to manipulate my peers. And I felt that that was a transferable skill in later life. I felt it would transfer well into sales. So I could organize an event and get all of my school to come in five days notice. And I thought that would transfer, transfer well into life. I thought I was different. I had the suspicion, all the evidence that I wasn't. Right? The school told me that the grades were the, the, the barometer of success. My parents said the grades were the barometer of success. I was a 15-year-old kid without Instagram and the social media influences that we now have telling us that there's another way, convinced that I was slightly different and that, and that to be fair, I'd gone past the point of no return now because I'd, got, I'd completely disregarded my education. So I had, to, I had no fucking choice at this point. 16 years old, I was like, right, I'm not going to get in a good university. I'm going to get into a Paul Polytechnic University now. My brother went to Cambridge. My other brother went to LSE. They're account accountants and actuaries and stockbrokers. My sister's a lawyer. I'm not going to get into a good university because I'm shit at every everything. I can't spell, can't do math. So <laughs> better fucking, you know, figure something else out. Yeah. A path that nobody told me about. As I said, when I was 18 and I started my business, I didn't know what an entrepreneur was, didn't know the word. Yeah. Didn't know I was one until a couple of, a, a year into my business. Oh, entrepreneur, I couldn't spell it, still can't spell it. But I, I, apparently I was one. Mm. So like, you know, a lot of the time when people start businesses these days, they get into like the community of entrepreneurship and they, they get, you know, and then it becomes a hobby before it becomes their life. For me, I was one for like two years before someone told me the word. Yeah. I was trying to build something, you know? Um, I think that's all I can say, self-belief. I think that's probably my only real redeeming skill. I think everything else has been created by the self-belief. Yeah. I think I sound good on camera. I think I can talk well. I think all of that has come from self-belief because... I put myself in situations where I had to get better and most people would have avoided those situations. Do you, like, do you like proving people wrong? Don't care about people. No. People are wrong. I'm too so it's not none of that external not bothered it's really, all from you? The, the notion of proving people wrong has always felt so illogical to me in the context of like people, I want to I work hard to change the opinion of people that do not give a fuck about me when there's all these people that do care about me and that have backed me to prove right. Yeah. So this idea, it feels like a misuse of energy and time to prove people wrong yeah and it's so un i for me it's so unfulfilling mm. because i don't care about you anyway charlie poe at 16 years old that told me i'd never be anything and laughed at me when i said i was going to start a business like he messaged me now on facebook i'm 27 now i'll help him because like i the other thing about like holding that negative energy towards yeah. people and things is it just becomes like toxic for yourself so mm. i can't hold any resentment towards charlie you know you know, or anyone else that talks shit about me, or do you know, people talk shit about me now? Like, yeah. it feels like a misuse of my energy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I like it. So, youth. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of people that follow me that, because they're young, maybe feel like that's a disadvantage. They haven't got experience, they haven't got money, they haven't got contacts. There are major advantages to youth, and you're a very successful, still young mm. entrepreneur. So, what can you say to the youth? What's their advantage that they don't get about themselves? I, if, I, if I could be 21 now, 
You'd be dangerous. I'd be so <laughs> fucking dangerous. Oh my God. Every year I get older, I'm like, fuck, I better step this shit up. Like, every, genuinely, every year since I was 18, I've been like, oh, but, you know, like my, my, age, my, my youth at 18 years old was my greatest fucking weapon. Because what happens when you walk into a room and you're 18 years old, if you know your asshole from your dick, they're like, oh my God. Do you know what I mean? So you, the, the expectation is here, yeah. right? And if you come in here, yeah. the difference between the expectation and the reality is impact. Yeah. So I was making this much impact just because I could do my fucking tie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So people blown away and they're like, oh my yeah. God, I need to introduce you to someone. Da, 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 yeah. da. And I still get it now because I'm young and the company's public and I'm the CEO. But honestly, it's absolute weapon. People want to help you more. Yeah. They, they're more impressed by you. They see um, traits in you that they had in themselves, in themselves when they were young. They yeah. all want to give you a foot up. Everybody was like, oh my God, like, we'll introduce you to 25 people, you know? And they all want to like parent you to some degree. Ooh. The other thing, the more practical, technical thing, is you have a perspective on the world and an age group which other people do not have. And it's, it's almost impossible to create. If you're on TikTok right now, you have a better understanding of one of the most important media platforms in the world than like the 40 year olds working in marketing and yeah. people like me working in marketing. I'm still, I'm still grappling with TikTok because natively my friends don't use it. So I'm having to force yes. myself to use the platform to understand it. Yeah. There's, you can weaponize, you know, that's a huge weapon as well. Yeah. There are things you know as an 18 year old, as a 21 year old that are so tremendously valuable that the CEOs and boardrooms all around the world are grappling to understand that you can monetize if you can just put your fucking tie on and, yeah. you know, talk okay. Yeah. You know? I think it's valuable, even vital, like, because I'm 40, I started business when I was 26. Mm -hmm. And I figured out pretty soon, once I got my ego out of the way and didn't worry about being judged, actually, if I go and find 50, 60, 70 year old entrepreneurs, millionaires, 100 millionaires, billionaires, very successful business owners, I can learn a lot and I can sort of shorten my journey to success. Yeah. And then I got to a point, I thought, wait a minute. I can learn a lot from the 20 year old kids as well. Yeah, yeah. And like hanging around, I hang around with Harry a lot, with Kieran who are in their twenties and it makes me feel young. It gives me energy that maybe a 60 or a 70 year old can't necessarily give me. They give me experience and wisdom. Of course, you know, Kieran is, and, and he, he doesn't mind me saying this, he's on social media all the time. He was born with an iPhone stuck to his phone. Yeah. You know, like tweeting about it yeah. on Instagram and when he popped out of his mouth, you know, literally. Yeah, and, but he, he doesn't remember dial-up. He doesn't have that pain in his I, life, dial-up. How old are you, Kieran? 25. 25. And how long do you spend on your phone a day? Uh, average screen time is about four to five hours. No, it's not. Bullshit. Yeah, it is. Like Bullshit. Like Mine's yeah, 11. Yeah. Bullshit. I've been with my girlfriend this week, so it dropped down to eight and a half. Oh, wow. A day. Yeah, so I, I, like, you, hanging around with youth gives you energy enthusiasm. You know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And that's what so social chain has been notoriously known for having a, if you go to the office of Manchester, there's 250 people. The average age is about 20, probably about 24 now, but it was 21 for the first so two and a half old. years. I mean, I was one of them back then, but yeah. like now I'm, yeah, now, uh, now I do feel a bit older. <laughs> yeah. I do wonder what's going to happen. I'm like, am I going to just like, like, uh, because I've not quite gone on that transition yet. I'm probably in you know, the middle mm. phase of like losing touch with the, 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 the new digital platforms. Um, like TikTok yeah. is the first one where I'm like, I don't natively use that, but yeah. we'll see. Cool. So social media trends, you're obviously hot on social media. Mm -hmm. You're on all the channels. So would you see some trends for you know next 12 months? Yeah, super important ones. Yeah. First one is um, like owning owning your audience and what i mean by that is like owning the data it's something super important for you as well yeah is you well, probably you don't own seen most of it do you no you don't fucking own no. any of it so we've got two million followers across our platforms and if and i'm the meeting that i'm going to after this is with our publisher that we've just done the, the deal with and i was thinking to myself when this book comes out how am i going to get these two million people to to buy it mm. so I can, okay i can do an instagram story i can put a link there i can't do a, a link in the feed right yeah. if i do a link anywhere else it'll lower it in the reach, algorithm yeah so I'm like, what was the point in building this massive audience if I can't reach them when I need yeah. to do the most? And then what you would have seen over the last couple of months is everybody posting phone numbers. Mm. Right? Mm. Seen that? Yeah. So the new thing, which are the biggest YouTubers in the world, Gary Vaynerchuk, everybody, yeah. all the, you know, the Jay Shetty, mm. is uh, there's this platform called community.com, which allows you to um, own the data for once. Yeah. So I've got, I put my phone number in my bio. You'll see it on all of my videos. Yeah. Anybody that texts me, I can text them back whenever. Yeah. And I can geolocate. So I can text a thousand people that live in LA right now that are female, 17 years old. 100% of them get them, no algorithm. Yeah. This is a big trend. And it brings back everything. It's like we've gone full circle, right? Yeah. Emails, 
going to be really, really important. Yeah. You, if you don't have an email newsletter now, it sounds like a crazy thing for a social media CEO to be saying. Wouldn't have said this six months ago. Yeah. Email newsletters, anywhere where you own the data, because the, out, the, the reach on social media platforms on Facebook over the last eight years has halved year on year. It halved this year for us as a publisher. And it will continue to do the graph is like fucking this. Where's yeah. it going? We call yeah. it Facebook zero. That's where it's fucking going. Yeah. Into the bin, right? So you, this audience you've spent all this time building up, how much of them do you own? So that's one of the big shifts, probably the most significant one. Obviously, if we're talking about platforms, podcasting is going to continue to rise, rise like crazy. Yeah. Spotify doing crazy, crazy things. Buying up everyone. Everybody. Yeah. The Obamas, they just yeah. signed a contract with the Obamas to do yeah. a podcast on Spotify. That's going to continue as we get into this voice-activated world and smart cars and everything. Voice is going to become even more yeah. pertinent. Um, and then I would say... Um, what's another interesting development? I think the next big shift, this is a grander one in social media, the big next shift um, is when wearable technology, and this is going to be a tremendous opportunity for everybody, when wearable technology gets to the point that it um, makes the iPhone uh, look like a, a, a useless brick. And there's, we, we anticipate within the next five or 10 years, it'll get to a point where you can wear something and that it has a digital app store on it um, that will replace this. And it's likely, a lot of people think it's going to be like a contact lens or, or like a, a socially acceptable. This is the big thing between the fucking and the Google Glass. A socially acceptable piece of technology you can wear that completely eradicates the use of this big piece of glass that we carry around. Yeah, That's the big shift for, for social networking because then Facebook becomes a virtual world. And all these social platforms completely change. And we've seen for the first time ever, this year and last year, the, the sales of smartphones have now stagnated for the oh. first time ever. And that was because there's genuinely nothing else that you could do to this form factor. Yeah. They're, they're trying to fold them again. Yeah. It's, it's like, this is, this is the, as far as this goes, we've done skinny, we've done big screens, we've gone smaller again, we tried to fold it again. This is, and that's why the sales, because I don't need anyone. Yeah. Um, and so that'll be the big thing. That's the thing that I'm looking out for to, to you know, potentially get on another wave. But yeah, I could go on all day about this. Yeah. So they're messaging me everywhere saying we've got to start wrapping this oh, up. No, let's no. do a quick fire. Sure, fine. I, I mean, look, I, I'll stay here for as long as you like. No, but no, um, no. yeah, let's do a quick fire then. Um, some of these are going to be long, so I'll probably circumvent some of them. We started something new on our podcast. Um, we're trying something a bit different. So we're doing a cheeky round. Okay. So if you don't like it, it's just a test. No, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, name drop the biggest celebrity or celebrities that follow you on social. Ah, Camila Cabello. Okay, cool. Um, what's the best or worst trolling you've ever had? Like the worst hate or shit that they've said about you? Or the best? <laughs> Some guy was like, you don't even fucking run a business. You've never even made 100K. You're a fucking liar. And I'm going to expose you if you're not careful. And I was just like, <laughs> I was just like how do I come at that? So I was just like, I just laughed. Um, that's one of them. And then people call me like Will Rizzle Kicks and Will Smith all the time. And fucking, you know. Being called Will Smith is yeah. a bit of a compliment, isn't it? I didn't see it though. Nah. Yeah. All right, I cool. get rizzle kicks a lot. Right. <laughs> Have you ever been sent naked pictures on social media? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever had a dick pic? No. Okay. All right. There you go. I've had a dick pic. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah, it was Kieran. <laughs> no, I haven't. So that's our cheeky man. Okay. So, um, yeah. Right. What's the best advice you've ever received? Probably, um, it's a cliche quote, but those who think they can and those who think they can't are both usually right. Yeah. And it just resonated with me because there's so much truth to that. Because in order to do these great things, um, and nobody appreciates the fact that you first, part of being able to is actually believing that you're capable of doing it. Yeah. And when, when I first heard that, it made my life make sense. In the context of me saying that my life was all about self-belief, that quote was so, so relevant to me because... I genuinely believe that so many people could do great things if only they believed they could. So I think that really stuck with me. Um, yeah. Love it. What's the worst advice you've ever received? Oh, fucking everything happens for a reason. Probably. <laughs> like, just, I think it's just total bullshit. Well, you got, I know this is a quick fire round, but you, got to, you can't open that. And um, I think if you say everything happens for a reason, you have to be able to tell. The reason we say that is we, we, we say it to... Um, bring comfort to something that happened in our life 
that doesn't make sense or that doesn't feel just, right? So we all like, you know, we lose our car keys, but we then end up missing the meeting, but we end up running into a guy at Starbucks that we wouldn't have been in and we end up marrying him. And we look back in hindsight, connect the dots and say, well, if that hadn't, if I hadn't lost my car keys then I wouldn't have met Rob, right? But um, we also, that's hindsight bias because we don't see all the things that we missed because of the decisions yes. we made. And also, if you say everything happened for a reason, then you have to tell me why those six million Jewish people were gassed to death and why little kids had their teeth pulled out and why there's parasites boring their way through the whole, the eyeballs of African kids as we speak. But it can't just be you meeting Rob because you lost your keys. And for me, that's like Western world, like naivety is like there's, there's like things happen, right? And there's not always a preconceived grand plan as to why those things are happening. I also think anything that robs you of um, uh, an internal locus of control, an internal internal control is generally not good for your mental health. It's also not conducive with you achieving the most you can. If you think that you're on some roller coaster and you're just buckled in and things are just fucking happening to you and you're just fucking everything's gonna work out and fucking end, you're getting fired and you're just like, whoa, it's gonna get me a millionaire sometime. Yeah. But I just think, I just think you have to take personal responsibility. And I think everything happens for a reason, robs you of that. Yes. I also think it's offensive to the nature of like, I think it's just this, this thing that, and people fucking hate it when I say this. It's the worst thing I say. If I post on my Instagram, I'm gonna lose fucking followers. It's this, it's because we're not prepared to deal with the fact that life is tough sometimes and shit happens for no reason. And in fact, it's not shit happening for no reason we have to deal with. It's our reaction to shit happening for no reason, which is a guaranteed part of life. Just like good things happening, you meet and rob. You know, they're all guaranteed. And we're just so bad at dealing with it. There has to be justice. Yeah. And we can't live with the fact that the world might not create just that Hitler might have, you know, got away with what he'd done and he never faced, you know, we can't live with that. And that's, for me, the nature of the world. Yeah. Um, is there one thing in the world that you'd really like to change that you think is really wrong? Oh God, the first thing that came to my head. Yeah, do that. Was, oh God, people are going to like this. Um, uh, the first thing that came to my head was, I think generally speaking, there's an attitude towards mental health that um, if you're undergoing some mental health issues, it's because you are broken in some way or that you are, there is some horrible drastic chemical imbalance in your brain. And in some cases there is, but I think um, more broadly and the less appreciated factor is that it's the way we're living our lives these days. I think that as human beings, when we were, we evolved from the savannas in Africa or whatever, um, and we were in tribes and we were hunting and we we're out in nature and we were, and things were quite simple and we we're with our families and our tribes. If you contrast that, there's been no evolutionary change really since then to the world we live in now where we order our food by tapping a glass screen. We don't see our friends and family. We're in four white walls living yeah. alone in cities like We're never York. really cold. We're not humans that. anymore. Yeah. And of course, that we have got, if, we, if you take something out of its comfort zone of the, the environment it's meant to be in, the human state it's meant to be in, of course there's going to be some kind of psychological impact. Yeah. And I think we're less human than ever before. It's no surprise that the, the in prisoners in prison, if they face them out onto grass in Greenland, they're 30 less likely to be depressed than those facing concrete. The, the best times we feel are when we're exercising, when we're with our family, when you have moments of your tribe, you know, like th that's the human part of us. But I think the world, because of um, money, a lot of it's because of money, has decided that the answer to a lot of these problems is, is to medicate them. Because, and there's a big, I could go on forever, there's big scandals over the last 30 years where big drug companies have been prosecuted because the results they've shown about mental health drugs have been knowingly inaccurate. Yeah. Some huge, huge finds. And Johanna Hari writes about it in his book, Lost Connections. Yeah. All right, thank you. Cool. So this is a question that goes around on the podcast, which I've never asked because I don't want to be like all the other podcasts. And that is what advice would you give your younger self or your 25-year-old mm -hmm. self? So I'm going to spin on his head and do something different. What advice would you give your future 50-year-old self? Um... The first, again, the first thing that came into my head was I would just plead with him to realize that um, family, your girlfriend, friends um, matter so much more than your 27-year-old ambitious crazy brain appreciates and to not allow those good things like my niece that's just been born and my other niece that's on the way um, to be sacrificed in the pursuit of something that probably isn't worth half as much. Mm. It would be like me pleading with that guy not to be a lonely 50-year-old man with loads of fucking money. Yeah. Just loads of money, like the poorest fucking rich guy, mm. you know? Yeah, great. If there's one guest, we started to ask this maybe six or seven shows ago. Yeah, yeah. If there's one guest you think we should have on the show, yeah, who would it be? Yeah, Johanna Hari. Okay. Yeah. 
He's uh, just, he wrote Lost Connections and it really shifted my perception on like mental health and happiness and therefore success and business. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And he lives in London and yeah. he's just a great fucking talker. He's got the most incredible stories and research and places he's traveled in the world to find out all this information. It's just yeah. incredible. He's been on Joe Rogan's podcast. He came on mine. He's right. really, yeah. Cool. Check him out. Cool. Um, so you, I saw on your LinkedIn, because we um, follow each other on LinkedIn, <laughs> about you were pretty anti writing books. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously you're about to launch your book. Yes. You're going to see your publisher in a minute if they don't fuck you off because you're so late. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're getting some serious. Yeah. <laughs> this is usually me that does this, yeah. but it's not me this time. Um, so, yeah, uh, why didn't you write a book ages ago? And why have you written one now? I didn't feel like I had anything to write about before. And I, again, as That's I said on my LinkedIn, like, wouldn't ever do anything just for the sake of doing it. Yeah. It's not like, to be completely honest, there's no, the financial incentive isn't compelling to me. No. The, um, the only incentive that's compelling is that I'll finally be able to, in full form, put down my ideas. Even in an hour podcast, I can give you like snippets, but I'm always reaching for context, yeah. right? And things, things are so nuanced and so like existential points and profound points require context. And finally, in a book, I can give that without having to rush or blah, blah, blah. And, um, I, and the reason why I'm writing the book is because I genuinely believe that I and many others like me were on their way, are on their way down a path in life which is, um, which will lead them to, in some cases, unhappiness, in some cases, self-loathing, in some cases, bad relationships, and in other cases, um, uh, a pursuit of and lack of success for like all the wrong reasons. I feel like this is my chance to intervene. I'm really like intervening 18 year old Steve. Yeah. And I'm really like trying to correct me. And I said to my to Lauren over there, my manager on the way here, I said, if one person, I, I swear in my mother's life I said this, I said, I would rather write a book that I really wanted to, I had to write about and one person bought it and that person was me and it just sat on my bookshelf than to write some poxy cliche book and sell a million copies. I swear on my fucking mom's life. Mm. I'd rather just sit for me and put it all down. These notes that I've had in my diary for five years that have compiled and created these perfect pictures and are finally aligned. I'd rather finally put that in a book than to do something that a publisher wants me to do or to do, you know? Yeah. Which is who I am, you know? It's probably yeah. why I didn't do well in school. Because mm. I just can't do things that I don't want to do. Yeah. You know? And what's the book called? I can't, I'm not allowed to say oh, it. Okay. I've signed a contract. Give you a no, yeah, so it comes, the, in January the pre-orders will go live and... Um, well, we'll it's put, we'll a really fucking you. interesting title. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. That's right. that. yeah. is, um, is it going to be an audible so we can listen as well? Yes, yeah. I'm doing the audio myself. I, I think that's important. Yeah, they've my, told me. Yeah. My audience have told me. You can do that because I do a podcast and they get used to... Yeah. yeah. Cool. So this last one. Last one. Sure. All right. What's the meaning of life? Not really. Um, so this podcast has the word disruptive in the title. Sure. Um, it's a word I like. What does it mean to you? It's just, it's just that self-belief to pursue the ideas that matter to you. And um, when you do that, because so few, few people are willing to pursue those ideas that matter to them, people call it disruption, right? But really all it is is confidence of your convictions. Yeah. And I, as we talked about earlier, pursuing that cause that's completely worthy. Yeah. And you look at people like Elon Musk, all of his PayPal money, put it all into space travel and electric cars. This is not, and this is what then we call that disruption. This is a guy that had a really noble cause that was great enough to, to risk it all. Um, and he had the confidence to do it. And you know, and that's what disruption is, I think. Mm. I think it's probably misunderstood. I think people think disruptors are people that sit and they, they're like fucking Einstein and they're reimagining the nature of the world and they, they see all the dots connecting and perfect. I don't think it's that. I think you have one singular pursue or belief, you back yourself and you're willing to put in the hard work and you have the persistence to see it through. And then the world looks at you and says disruptor. Mm. You often don't think you are, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like a, lot with a, lot, a lot with a lot of the greats. It's something that other people attri attribute to you after the fact, so mm. yeah. Great, and your podcast is called? The Diary of a CEO. Great. It's everywhere, yeah. Yeah, and where should we follow you? What are your main? Um, any way you like. If you, I'm Stephen on Instagram. I'd say the best place, quite honestly, is probably the podcast. Yeah. I think that's where you get the depth. It's called The Diary of a It's my honest diary. It's the, you can tell that I, I try and say things how they are, and I'm very personal and open, and it's the, the platform that my audience enjoy the most, and, yeah. and that I enjoy producing the most. Great. So we're both in a lot of trouble, but yeah. it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Thanks, it's been Steve. a pleasure to be on this podcast, because I've listened to it a number of times. Thank it, you. It's one of the... 
the more famous podcast in this in this sector. So it's a privilege for you to ask me to be on. I'm truly appreciative of that. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks for taking time on your very busy schedule. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Cool. Thanks, mate. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.